Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding Near Field Probes. In this short presentation, we'll explain the basic principles behind near field probes and how they're used in EMI pre-compliance testing. As you may already know, EMI compliance testing verifies that radio frequency emissions from an EUT, or equipment under test, do not exceed a specified limit. These emissions may be either conducted out of the EUT, via wires or cables, or be radiated out over the air. Radiated pre-compliance testing is a procedure used to identify, locate, and debug the sources of these non-compliant radiated emissions. This should be done before the formal compliance test, since catching EMI-related problems early can save significant time and money. Radiated compliance testing is done in the far field using antennas, but radiated pre-compliance testing is normally performed in the near field using near field probes. At this point, it might be a good idea to pause for a moment and discuss far field and near field. Electromagnetic waves consist of both an electrical and magnetic component that propagate at right angles to each other. In the far field, these two components, normally abbreviated E and H, will have roughly the same magnitude. In the near field, on the other hand, one of these two fields will be dominant. The dominant field depends on the characteristics of the source of the emission, for example, the voltages and currents, impedances, terminations, etc. There are various mathematical ways to define near field and far field, but as a practical matter, near field EMI testing is usually performed within centimeters of the equipment under test. Generally speaking, if a signal can be detected in the far field, it can also be detected in the near field, although the reverse of this is not necessarily true. As the name implies, near field probes, also sometimes called sniffer probes, are used to make measurements in the near field. This is almost always done when trying to locate the physical source of an emission, for example, a component, a trace on a printed circuit board, etc., or sometimes when trying to locate a gap or defect in shielding. Because near-field probes are usually much smaller than a wavelength, it's relatively easy to use them in enclosed spaces, and easier to get higher spatial resolution, that is, high accuracy, with regards to the location of an emission. Note, however, that near-field probes are generally used for relative measurements, rather than for highly accurate, absolute measurements of the received signals. And because they're used in close proximity to the EUT, they typically are insulated, to prevent electrical contact with the EUT and avoid shorts and other associated issues. And finally, in some cases, near-field probes are also used to inject or to radiate signals into the EUT, but we won't be covering this topic in our presentation. The basic procedure for using near-field probes is as follows. The instrument is set to observe power versus frequency while the position and or orientation of the probe is changed. An increase in signal level indicates closer proximity to the source. Power versus frequency is the default measurement result on a spectrum analyzer, but an oscilloscope will need to be in FFT, or spectrum mode, in order to observe frequency domain information. If an oscilloscope is used, it should also be set to have a 50 ohm termination. Because the received signals may not be very strong, instrument settings should be optimized to reduce noise. For spectrum analyzers, a narrower resolution bandwidth is recommended, and using high resolution or high definition mode in an oscilloscope can also help to reduce noise. As we'll discuss in just a few moments, it's often a good idea to use different sizes and different types of near-field probes. Near-field probes can be divided into two types, electric or E-field probes and magnetic or H-field probes. Most near-field probe kits will contain both types of probes. These probes are designed to, ideally, respond only to one near-field component. Let's start by looking at E-field probes. Since E-field probes are designed to respond to the electric field, they're primarily used to detect voltages, not currents. Most E-field probes have a pen-like shape, as shown here, and maximum response occurs when the probe is held perpendicular to the current. However, compared to H-field probes, which we'll discuss next, 
probe orientation is not quite as critical. E-field probes are often physically quite small, and smaller size probes provide greater spatial resolution, that is, the ability to narrow down the source of an emission to a specific pin or printed circuit board trace. In most cases, the E-field is perpendicular to the surface of a conductor, so E-field probes should be held perpendicular to the tested conductors. Large area E-field probes are more efficient for searching larger areas. Once the general area has been established, a smaller near-field E-probe is used to more accurately locate the physical source of an emission. H-field probes are designed to respond to the magnetic or H-field. This means that they're primarily used to detect current changes rather than voltages, and thus are more useful when looking for higher frequency emissions. Almost all H-field probes are constructed in the form of a loop, although smaller, rod-like form factors are sometimes also used. As we'll cover in more detail shortly, the diameter of the loop is very important. Larger loops have greater sensitivity, that is, they're better at picking up weak signals. Smaller loops have less sensitivity, but will have greater spatial resolution. Their smaller size makes it easier to determine the precise source of an emission. In many cases, the best approach is to start with a larger loop to determine the general area, and then move to smaller loops to narrow down the exact location. Because loop probes are highly directional, the orientation of the loop relative to the direction of current flow is also very important. The maximum response occurs when the magnetic field lines pass through the loop, and the minimum response occurs when the field lines are parallel to the loop, that is, when the field lines don't pass through the loop. Therefore, when searching for emissions using H-field probes, the probe should be rotated and or have its orientation changed until the strongest response is found. Let's take a closer look at how this works. Here we see a PCB with a single trace. When current flows in this direction along the trace, it produces magnetic field lines as shown. If we position an H-field loop probe such that the plane of the loop is parallel to the current path, the field lines will pass through the loop and maximum response is seen. If, on the other hand, we position the loop such that the plane of the loop is perpendicular to the direction of current flow, the magnetic field lines will not pass through the loop and minimum response occurs. From this example, it should be clear why rotating the loop can be helpful when trying to determine the source of an emission. One final topic we need to cover is preamplifiers. A signal received from a near-field probe may have a very low signal-to-noise ratio. Therefore, preamplifiers are sometimes used between the near-field probe and the instrument input in order to increase the received signal level. Preamplifiers are particularly helpful in three cases. The first is when the level of emissions is very low. The second is when the oscilloscope, spectrum analyzer, or receiver has a high level of internal noise. And the third case is when using smaller H-field loops, since the smaller loops have reduced sensitivity. The typical gain of a preamplifier used with near-field probes is in the range of 20 to 40 dB. Note, however, that the preamplifier can add noise, so using a preamp with low added noise, or a low noise figure, is highly recommended. Let's end with a brief summary. Near-field probes are primarily used in EMI pre-compliance and debugging in order to detect and then locate non-compliant radiated emissions, typically down to the component, trace, or pin level. Near-field probes can be used with different types of instruments, such as oscilloscopes, spectrum analyzers, and EMI receivers. There are two main types of near-field probes, E-field probes, which respond to the electric field, and H-field probes, which respond to the magnetic field. Of these two, H-field probes are more widely used, but most near-field probe kits come with both E and H probes. With regard to H-field loop probes, the orientation of the loop is very important. Maximum response occurs when the loop is positioned such that the magnetic field lines pass through the loop. And finally, preamplifiers placed between the probe and the instrument can be helpful when the measured signals are small or when the measuring instrument's internal noise is high. This concludes our presentation, Understanding Near-Field Probes. If you'd like to learn more about near-field probes, 
EMI pre-compliance testing, or instruments used in pre-compliance testing, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching.